Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm Severa Davis. I'm Director of Design and Challenges here at the RSA, as well as Director of the RSA Student Design Awards Program. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's special event celebrating the launch of the 2016-17 RSA Student Design Awards Program. For those of you who may not know, if you've been here before, you've heard me say this, um, the RSA Student Design Awards is an annual curriculum and competition that challenges emerging designers to use design thinking and skills to tackle today's most pressing challenges. We work closely with our industry partners to develop these briefs. They come in a pack like this. Uh, get yourself one while you can. Um, and we work closely with colleges and universities to embed them in the curriculum. The RSA Student Design Awards is only made possible by our support from our industry partners, so I would like to use this very privileged opportunity while I'm here briefly to thank them now. Many of you are in the audience and I'd like to um, extend a special thanks to you for the support that you've given us in developing the briefs um, and, and being here and supporting us in all of our endeavors to support the next generation of designers. This evening's event marks the culmination of today's program launch where we've been hearing from those industry partners about the briefs we've co-developed and we've been welcoming educators from around the country to hear about the program for this year. Ultimately, the RSA Student Design Awards is about fostering and rewarding the next generation of designers concerned with how design can and will help us move to a better world. We celebrate these designers every year. This is the group from 2016 and we look forward to doing it all again in this room in 2017. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to kick off tonight's event. Before we begin, could I kindly ask you to switch your mobile phones to silent? But a reminder that we're filming this evening and streaming live over the web, so welcome to everyone joining us online, and a reminder that the hashtag is RSA Design. Please get involved in the discussion on Twitter. Housekeeping notice is over. I'm delighted to introduce today's distinguished speaker. Carrie Bishop is a director at FutureGov, the digital and design company for public services where she works on projects focused on using social technologies for better collaboration, open innovation, or organizational change. She has a background in local government and is a self-confessed obsessive on about how technology, design, and positive disruption can improve public services. As we'll hear, Carrie is a strong believer in design as a force for social good, and her talk this evening will highlight the role of design as now more urgent than ever before. I think you'll agree we couldn't have a more fitting speaker for the launch of the Student Design Awards program. Please join me in welcoming Carrie Bishop to the stage. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for so many of you coming on this incredibly warm evening. Um, hello designers and people who work with designers and people who help designers and support designers and champion designers. Um, uh, as Sebra said, um, I run a company called FutureGov. We've been going for about eight years. There's about 30 or 40 in the company. We're based here in the UK with a small office um, in Australia, but we've also worked in a whole bunch of places um, across the world. And our main focus is local government. So we work with cities, counties, and small local authorities to work at ground level, tackling problems that um, occur throughout um, sort of a local level. We do do some central government work, but our primary focus is on local government. Um, and these are the things we believe in, really, and this is how our company is structured. Um, so we have uh, a service design team. Hopefully, you'll all be familiar with what that is. I don't need to explain. Um, and a product design team and an organization design team. What's interesting about the organization design team is it's a kind of fairly new team for us because um, what we found we were doing was creating really interesting services that were really solving problems and building technology products that were supporting those services. Um, and then we would kind of go, here's, here's the thing, we've made it, um, and it would kind of fall flat because what we learned is um, we're dealing with public institutions that are kind of, in some cases, sort of centuries old, certainly founded on decades old principles, and they're actually, they're not designed to be able to make a success of this kind of innovation. So what we've started to think about is how do we, organ how do we design organisations? How do we design public services as a whole so they're able to make a success of emerging technologies, different ways of doing things, um, and service design? in particular. And I think what makes us unique is the kind of um, the bringing together of those three designs, um, and it, it's something that we really believe in. 
Um, these are some products that we've made. Um, I'll just focus on a couple. Casserole is a community meal sharing network. So um, if you're cooking and you have a spare plate or you chuck in an extra portion, we'll match you with an older person who lives near you. You take the food round, you have a cup of tea, you check they're okay. Um, you can do it once and never again, or you can do it on an ongoing basis. And we find people tend to do it on an ongoing basis. Um, and then patchwork is um, a tool that solves a problem where if you're a social worker and you go into a family for the first time to work with them, you have no way of knowing who else from which other public agency is also working with your family. So um, patchwork, with Patchwork, you'll type in the, the name of your client and their contact details, and then you'll see anyone else who's also working with them. It's kind of like a supercharged phone directory, but believe it or not, it doesn't already exist. Um, so uh, th those are our two kind of most prominent products. Um, so as alongside our service design, we also build things as well. Um, right. Uh, <laughs> At least one of these three things is a travesty. <laughs> um, <laughs> and <laughs> um, <laughs> oh dear. Um, it's all gone to shit, hasn't it? Basically, is what we're saying. <laughs> so, um, but I'm sorry, by the way, there will be swearing, and I, I can't help it. But because I think also, right, it's not just to be dramatic, but things are unprecedented, right? We live in crazy, changing times, and I think well, our responses need to match the intensity of the times that we're living in. And I think that's kind of like one of the themes that I want to get across today. It's like we can't just sit back and pretend things are normal because they're not, and our responses have to be just as dramatic as the kind of the turbulence that we're living amongst. Um, so everyone loves, loves a listicle, so I made a listicle um, of the four ways that the country is in a sort of pivotal moment. Um, number one, look at this map. Half the country wants something that the other half doesn't. I'm talking about Brexit for those who didn't, haven't conveniently forgotten that moment in history. Uh, it's easy to kind of block it out of your mind, but it, it's happened. Um, and it doesn't, you know, in or out or whatever, it's not really about that, right? Brexit is the symptom of the fact that half the country wants something that the other half doesn't. So as we talk, let's think about how can design help with that? How can design start to help bridge that divide? Number two, racism. It's bad enough that it might happen in private, and now it's openly happening on our streets. Um, it's not okay and it's not acceptable. How can design play a role in putting a stop to that and take responsibility for some of that? Um, and not just kind of go, oh, well, that's a problem, but well, I'm not racist, so that's okay. Like, what is all of our part in changing that? Um, what the, f I mean, it's like, there's nothing, right? There's, there's a kind of, nature hates a vacuum. So what happens when there's a vacuum? Kind of other forces sweep in. So design could be one of those forces. So how about we make that happen rather than waiting for other um, kind of uh, more sinister forces to sweep in? Um, and also, and I think this is really important to remember, and uh, I imagine there are some people here who um, c can cast their minds back and others who can't, but um, the roots of all of what's, what we're seeing today go back a long way. It's not like this is an overnight thing that's just happened and all of a sudden we've woken up as this divided country. These divisions have been a long time in the making, perhaps even longer ago than this, which is 1984, ironically. Um, so, so what we're looking at is some kind of deep-seated, entrenched wicked problems um, that we need to address. Nothing is better placed to address those problems than design, um, because design can deal with complexity, design can deal with constraints, um, design has empathy, um, so we're all ideally placed to be the people solving these problems. Um, so this is my kind of call to arms um, that we all, le at least all of us, leave this room vowing to do something about some of this, even in our own small way. Um, the thing about design is, and, um, is that it's, it's, it can be really hard to sort of take on... <laughs> everyone's read it. Everyone's, uh, shall I read it out, just in case? Uh, it's as if the technotopians don't get that 3D-printed laser, un laser unicorn robots aren't a substitute for a working society. That is one of my favourite quotes of all time um, by Umar Haik. And um, the, thing about, the thing about it is... is you know, I love stuff, right? I've got an iPhone. I, who doesn't love a laser unicorn robot? Who doesn't love that? Um, we all do, but the thing is, there are other problems that need solving, the more pressing problems that need solving. Um, and hey, maybe these laser unicorn robots can help us solve that problem. Um, but design really needs to kind of take a look at itself and take a look at the problems that are out there and think, how can we play a part in solving some of this? That's why this programme is incredibly exciting and the work that other colleagues are doing incredibly exciting um, and we should be shouting about that. Um, 
Because ultimately, you know, we have these kind of great things, these brilliant digital improvements and products. Uber is revolutionising transport, but in cities for people who can afford it. Um, not to mention um, some of their business practices that are a little bit questionable. So um, what we, we've done a project in um, Essex and Suffolk where um, we've, un, we've done some research with people who are older people, for example, who struggle. Does anyone come from like a rural area? They've grew up in a rural area, there's a few hands I did. It was one bus a week when I, when I lived in the countryside. Um, it was on a Thursday morning and all the pensioners wanted to go, to go and get their pension. Um, that's what it's like to live in a rural area and Uber doesn't mean anything to you and Uber won't come to you because it's not profitable for them. So we need different interventions that deal with transport and mobility and movement of people because otherwise what we end up is really insular, isolated communities and that isolation breeds some of the dissatisfaction that we've been seeing over the last year. Um, Equally, you know, things um, like Airbnb doesn't help people around their own home, doesn't help people um, live in their own homes um, when, they're, when they're not feeling great or as they start to deteriorate as they get older. Um, and likewise, Deliveroo, while I love Deliveroo, which will bring me my food uh, within half an hour, um, it doesn't turn up and do the job of casserole club, which kind of turns people into friends. It's like, you know, you get your food, it's very anonymous, it's impersonal, but what can food do as a social object to bring people together? Um, and finally, um, so this is actually um, a lady that we met on one of our research projects who um, learned on YouTube sign language and then taught it to her son. So what we're finding is that people are kind of going outside of traditional institutions to learn these new skills, to learn ways of living. Um, they're using things like YouTube um, just to kind of to help them in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, there isn't stuff out there for people other than that. So how can we kind of harness some of that and make use of it and recognise what it's bringing to people? Um, right, what are we going to do about this? We, this room, we, the people we work with and support, um, Here's Margaret again. Uh, she's like the poster child for uh, transport and Essex. And, um, so it, I spoke about transport and kind of physical mobility, but it's also about metaphorical mobility, right? It's about uh, broadening people's horizons, giving opportunities to experience new things, um, kind of uh, opening up opportunities for people um, to move whether it's physically or kind of emotionally or mentally. Um, design can play a huge role in that. Um, Designing out social isolation, that is something that um, design is like really well placed to address um, because uh, it's constrained, um, it's a kind of a tricky problem, but it deals with humans. Um, so in particular, service design and technology, these are the kind of tools that we can use to address some of this. Um, how, I mean, has, housing is a whole other talk, right? But housing is one of those things that is kind of key and fundamental to some of the, the problems and challenges that we see, both in cities, actually, and in um, more rural communities. Housing and housing availability. How can we reinvent housing? What role can design play in that? You know, from architects through to interior designers, right the way through to the people who are designing the business models that sit around housing and housing infrastructure. Um, this is my pet rant, but... Um, I think also we can be a bit complacent in the, in the public sector and we can sort of think we can look to best practice, which is also known as copying, um, so it's not really innovation, um, it's copying, um, we can look to best practice, and, um, but what we should be doing is looking outside of our sector and looking um, for examples of inspiration. Um, and one of my favourite things at the moment is McDonald's, um, which is weird because um, people can be a bit snobby about McDonald's and oh, I don't know McDonald's, but... Um, we uh, spoke with a group of young people um, in a city near Manchester and about 50 young people will coordinate on WhatsApp and show up at a McDonald's. Um, the reason they go there is because free Wi-Fi and charging their phone, um, which is pretty much all that group of young people cared about. Or not all they cared about, it was definitely their number one priority, like a basic human right, um, Wi-Fi and charge. Um, and I said to the council, who, who I have a deep affection for and who, actually, who are trying incredibly hard, um, what would you do if 50 young people showed up at the library? Um, because, you know, libraries have free Wi-Fi and they're charging. And they said, we'd probably call the police. Um, <laughs> because uh, it's intimidating, a big group of young people, we don't know what to do with them. Um, and I feel like, uh, actually, that council's doing a really good job of trying, uh, you know, they recognise that that response is not being okay and they're trying to address that. But others aren't. Um, others are genuinely terrified of large groups of young people, which, you know, we all remember being a young person, right? You know, most of us are good kids. So... 
But what McDonald's has understood perfectly is that young people want free Wi-Fi and charging. So they've provided that. And they understand something about young people that public services don't. So what can we learn from McDonald's and others, Starbucks and those other kind of modern... They're modern community centres, right, in some ways. Um, and how can we design public services with that in mind? Um, the other thing... Uh, <laughs> The other way that we can kind of get started is, no, well, number one, we tend to think of resources and money as a fixed pie. There is a certain amount of money. It can only go around. There is scarcity. If we always operate from this model of scarcity, um, we won't get anywhere um, because it sets us in competition against each other. It kind of avoids collaboration. Um, but, so what we have to do is find the money. And there is money because I see it being spent in crazy ways in the public sector all the time. So the money's definitely there. It's just how can we dig it out? So kind of being a financial archaeologist and finding out where the budget lines are, finding out who's responsible for things, what are some little pet pots of money that are sitting around? Because I assure you those things exist. Um, you may find yourself as a designer having to write a business case, which... I mean, it, it literally gives me sh chills to say that. Um, but it, that's your modern toolkit, right? Being able to justify the work that you do. You, can't, you can do some speculative work, of course, and we should always encourage that kind of speculation. But when it comes down to it, somebody somewhere is going to be asking you to prove it. Um, and you have to be prepared for that. So one of your tool sets has to be writing business cases, understanding finances, knowing what new business models are. That's a part of your job now. Um, Okay, four quick ways to go about it, because listicles. Um, number one, um, learn the rules and then break them. And this is kind of like a universal law, right? This applies in every single craft. But um, public services have rules as well. You know, they have conventions, they have procurement rules, they have ways of doing things. They actually have legal obligations and things like democratic accountability. Um, you have to learn that stuff. You can't sort of waltz in and go, you guys are idiots, why don't you just do it like this? Like, there's a, there can be an arrogance sometimes to those fresh eyes that come into a new situation. Um, but what we need to do is kind of un be humble, understand that we don't know everything, learn those rules, and then trash them. But find them with a different... Trash them with a different... Uh, coming from a place of knowledge um, and with an alternative rather than just kind of rebelling against them for no reason. I'm telling you all this because I've done this. Like, I know what it feels like. Um, and I think, you know, also dismissing those kind of traditional institutions as old school or whatever um, actually doesn't serve us because... Um, those traditional institutions do have a part to play in the solutions and we shouldn't be so quick to disregard them. You know, they have the networks. Local, lo local government in particular is kind of really well placed within a local context. It knows all the partners. It knows all the people who are doing things. Um, they have the money, right? So let's try and be friends with them. Um, they also have the remit to do something about things quite often. How you then kind of get to that remit is another question, but um, it's there. Um, and they also have the leadership, and it depends where you go, right? We spoke earlier about the leadership vacuum. Um, the other thing that designers do beautifully is identify where power lies in a system and then disrupt it. Um, and that's one of the things I love most about designers is that they, um, they're really good at spotting you know, a centralised hierarchical process or um, organisational structure and saying, what would this be like if we distributed it? What would be, it be like if we, in fact, reversed it, flipped power on its head um, and asked why? Uh, and I think that's really a really important thing to hold on to in these kind of challenging times. Um, also... You know, if you're designing from London, you're not pushing yourself. You're not challenging yourself enough. You know, there are fewer constraints here. You're around people who will pat you on the back and say your idea is brilliant. Um, it'll totally work in London. Well, of course it will. Um, but London isn't where a lot of the problems that exist and have kind of um, come to light recently, um, that's not the locus of those problems. So how, get out of London. Go and spend a couple of weeks in cities around the, uh, around the country or um, better still in rural villages and things, places where things aren't happening, where you can't have the comfort of Uber and Deliveroo and all the rest of it um, because that's where the real change um, and real work of design needs to be done. Um, finally, um, if you're going to tinker around the edges don't bother, okay? It's not rewarding, um, it's not worth doing, um, and our problems are bigger than tinkering, okay? So we have to grab this opportunity because um, we, time's running out, these things are really important and pressing. Um, so whatever you do, make it good, make it big, um, be ambitious, try and take on a big thing rather than being o overwhelmed and intimidated by it, even though these problems are incredibly intimidating. Um, as I've said, 
all along, designers have the power to do this. They have a key role to play in this. And I think if, if designers kind of sit back and let it happen, then the world will be missing something really important. Designers have good networks. Um, they know each other and know how to network with people. Um, they have the skills and the tools um, to do it. You all know what those are. Crucially, they have the empathy. Designers are very empathic, I find. They kind of, they want to understand um, what it is that somebody's motivation. Um, do your user research. T spend time to understand the problem. Um, that's what designers do so brilliantly, and that's what we need right now, empathy, um, compassion for each other. Um, but also guts, right? We need to be a bit ballsy about this. We need to take the ball by the horns. We need to do something radical, um, and designers have that too in spades. This is my final message. This is difficult. Um, it's easy to kind of stand on a stage and say, hey, do all the radical things, but it's so hard, and it's so exhausting sometimes. Um, but please don't give up trying, because um, if we all gave up, then, well, where would we be? Um, so support each other, um, support yourselves in what you're doing, but please never, ever give up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carrie. I don't think I've smiled so much about how shit things are in a long time, so, uh, so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I think there's probably lots of questions from the audience. We have lots of people here from the RSA Student Design Awards uh, sort of family, so I'd like to give uh, everyone a chance to, to ask a question. But um, I suppose the first thing I want to ask you is, and it sort of builds on what you just said, and sort of talking about designers and the, the network, the skill, the networks, the skills, the empathy, and the guts. And I think a lot of young designers would say they, through their education, have three of those things. They've, they've gained the skills, they have the empathy, and they're brave, and they're ready to go out in the world, but they feel that they're lacking those networks sometimes. So what, yeah. what do you sort of, to a young designer who wants to do this, who wants to be brave, where do they start? Um, I, I mean, I think uh, doing your research pays off, like find out who's doing good, interesting things. You know, um, the, and we live in a time right now where design is valued in public services like never before. So, you know, there are people, I see some of them in the audience, who are doing great things in government and they're the place to start. And, you know, not regularly people will email me and say, hey, can I pick your brain or can we have coffee? And um, sometimes I fail to reply to that email because <laughs> I have, like, many unread emails in my inbox. Um, but sometimes, but sometimes I do, and quite often I forward that to my team and say, hey, do you want to chat to this person? I think, so, net, like, learn to network, right? Just get out there, ask questions, be interested, be curious, go to events. You quickly understand, like, the landscape if you do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're now going to open up to questions from the audience. Uh, there are ro roving microphones. I see them at the back there. If you raise your hand, um, and then the microphone will come to you. Got one over here. Hello, I'm Hi. Derek Yates. I work in design education. Um, all the way through your talk, I was thinking, yeah, brilliant, you know, but is what we're doing in design education preparing students to face that challenge? I mean, what's your perception of, of the preparation we're giving students to enter into this world? I th are we going to do like one by one or th three at a time or I can do one, one by one. Let's, let's answer that yeah. one. And uh, okay, cool. So um, I, I think what I see is um, people coming through who are, you know, their, their skills are great um, and they, they have quite a holistic skill set, which is really good to see. Um, they're sometimes na a bit naive, like... I'm less likely to respond well to someone who's like, I want to change the world, than someone who's got like a specific social goal in mind. So I think it's like kind of helping people shape their ambition. Like, yeah, you want to help people, but how? Which people? Like, there are so many people to help, you know, so kind of prioritise that. Um, and I think, uh, so there's a bit of naivety sometimes about how easy this stuff is. And I also think just that reality check of like, it is, as a designer, it is your job to understand the business model behind your idea. Like, those kinds of things are sometimes missing, or maybe they're the bits that you teach that conveniently get forgotten because they're less sexy than the um, making. But um, making a business model is just as important to go alongside the idea, I think. Great. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Great. Uh, we've got a question at the back there. Hi. Um, so my question is around the application of design to more uh, more kind of wide conversations. So um, thus far in public services, design has been used to redesign services to include um, citizens and in how those services are either designed or delivered. And I think what you're talking about is also about this wider conversation about where Britain is going. So what is the role in, for, for design in these wider, bigger, kind of deliberative conversations? Um, that depends on... There's two answers to that. So the like, official answer is, um, you know, there are, there are lots of people working on deliberative platforms, ways of kind of bringing people together, convening, like designing democratic participation is totally a thing um, and, uh, and needs designers. Um, and I think that, you know, there are, there's interesting stuff going on actually around the world, like uh, different countries have different models of doing that, which is interesting. Um, and technology um, helps us to do that. Blockchain's kind of an interesting idea, transferring votes and stuff. So there's lots of potential there, I think, for analysing it. Um, so that's the official answer. The unofficial answer is, in my personal opinion, I, f I f feel my energy is more valuable being put into addressing some of the problems that create the tensions and issues that people what you need to, delib to deliberate about. Um, so I, rather than kind of creating space for conversation, I think there's a place for that. I think it's important. But for me personally, I'd rather put my energy into fixing some stuff um, because... I think, I think some of the tension that there is is as a result of stuff being broken rather than the need for better conversation, if you see what I mean. So that's my unofficial answer. Yes, uh, question at the back there. Hi. Uh, Barry Wadilov from the KTN Stroke Innovate UK. I'm quite interested in what you're saying about moving towards uh, more organization design. And uh, so I'm, this is something that we're quite involved in at the moment. And so I'm interested to know what, what would you say are your top three or top five hurdles that you find you have to get over when you do organization design? Well, I, number one, willing leadership, um, uh, kind of emotionally intelligent leaders who are prepared to examine their own behaviours um, and ask whether or not they match the, the values that they want to see in their organisation um, at, a, at a senior level because that unlocks so much of the kind of the ability to affect change within an organisation, especially a hierarchical organisation like a government organisation. Um, then there's also some process stuff. So, you know, um, if you want to change the shape of your organisation and restructure teams and hire different skill sets in and basically shift your organisation from being predominantly paper-based to being predominantly digital, for example, um, there are things like pay scales that are kind of nationally set um, that need to be addressed. Now, it's possible to address those. GDS shows us that it is, but um, there are lots of processes and things like that that kind of can at least slow down organisation design, if not stymie it completely. Um, and some of that's real and some of it's imagined as well. So there's a bit, there's a bit of that um, that gets in the way. Um, and then, yeah, I think like it's, it is really also, so emotional intelligence, but also bravery, then changing the shape of an organisation requires some really tough decisions that aren't always going to be popular. Um, and kind of managing that process is really important as well. Any further questions? Yes. Hello, um, I'm Penny Sims. I work for the British Red Cross and we do a lot of work in um, rural areas as well with, with older people especially. Um, could you tell us a bit about that project to do with the transport or an example of another project like that? It would just be interesting to hear you talk through the problem and the solution. Um, the, so the brief was, it's really hard to get around. <laughs> um, which as you can imagine we had to iterate uh, so um, we managed to get it down to something more specific that was about kind of a, well, a public transport rather than because at some point there, were talk, there was talk about car sharing and like all the different ways that a person could get around um, but uh, our process was really to, I mean we did our user research so 
Uh, the team spent a lot of time on the number one bus um, going around, or waiting for the number one bus, should I say, um, and uh, talking to older people, drawing maps of people's routes and where they typically go, so like lots of kind of user research in, in quite a tangible way. Um, and then narrowing, kind of looking at the, the whole system of transport, who are the actors within that, and what are their kind of different roles, um, how do they talk to each other or not talk to each other, so a bit of a kind of systems thinking about the whole thing. Um, and then uh, kind of experimenting with a few ideas and in particular thinking about um, demand responsive transport. So people being able to say, uh, I, I need to make this trip on this day or even today. Um, and that data being fed through to the transport organisations and then working with them to help them be willing to change their routes responsively according to the need that's being... Because one of the major challenges for rural transport is that there's just no data. Like, they, the transport companies know which routes are profitable, just about, and profit in that context is, I mean, the margins are so thin. Um, and they're not really prepared to experiment with new routes because it's costly. So they, and they don't have the data because they don't know who's in their home going, I wish I could go to the shops. So, um, so kind of finding ways of people being able to make those requests, whether it's just calling up and requesting a route or whether it's through a mobile app, which is something that we're currently developing um, and prototyping. Um, being able to adjust those routes in a kind of real-time way is the, go is the ultimate goal of that. I think it's a, it's a fairly long project, like it will take a while to get to a kind of scale where it's working really effectively and widely adopted across two counties. That's a, that's a pretty big ambition, but, um, but I think we're on the right track with it. Any further questions? One thing that uh, you and I were talking about before was um, and, and, and something in the Student Design Awards is obviously the, the global nature of these challenges. So I'm curious, um, and this was a, a slightly UK-focused mm. presentation about sort of what your sense is um, globally, how, um, how designers are either addressing these issues or not addressing them, and where, if the opportunities are, are different um, mm. from your experience. I think you've worked, you have worked abroad as well. Yeah. But um, I mean, we've done some stuff in the United Arab Emirates, which is obviously a really different context to the one that we're designing in here. So um, I think that, um, I mean, like humility and kind of uh, remembering that we're all kind of babies just learning our first steps in every new situation we go into is really important in those contexts because... Um, you know, it, even our work with the UAE at the start, we made a bunch of assumptions about how people might want to communicate, for example. So we set up Slack and there were all the Slack channels and it was like a ghost town. It was just tumbleweed rolling through Slack. Um, because actually it turns out that WhatsApp conversations in Arabic are far more effective um, way for people to communicate in that context. It's only a small difference, really. You know, it's a, it's a choice of tool, but it mattered. And the ability to speak in Arabic also mattered. So while we were like, well, you know, we're the designers, we're here to help you, you know, we must be included in these conversations. Actually, it's far more important that people can communicate with each other in their own language on the channel that suits them than we get to hear everything. Um, so kind of, kind of being a bit humble about that and um, adjusting based on the context is really important. I think there's, there is stuff, obviously, stuff going on all over the world and designers are, you know, in every country trying to do things, some more than others, some are making more headway than others. Um, there's so much scope and potential and there are kind of global programmes that, that support designers to do that. Um, but it's also really hard to feel, um, having done some design work abroad, myself personally, it, it can feel quite isolating as well because you're kind of, you know, you're trying to you're applying your own context to a new context and it, it's, it can be quite difficult to do. So I think like how you support those, how the design community supports itself as a whole globally is really important as well. Are there any final questions? Uh, yes, one over here. Hello. Um, you paint uh, an image of design as being a very positive, proactive uh, mechanism and yet we live in a world where for some there is a very tidy relationship between client business and design do you think it's time that the design profession itself is redesigned <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I mean well 
I don't think the design profession necessarily needs redesigning, but I think if people are frustrated by that dynamic, there's space to operate differently. Um, I would say that my company is quite challenging towards our clients. It can be hard work to work with us. I know that um, we won't, we don't appease clients often. You know, we obviously go out of our way to provide the best solutions possible, but that might be challenging in some instances, and we are prepared to have those arguments and sometimes they are arguments more often than not they're constructive conversations based in reason so that's good um, but there's space to do that and I think a lot uh, some designers are quite timid because they're concerned about money and but actually what you know what differentiates your design company from someone else's design company is your kind of willingness to fight for good ideas and to kind of have things good things happen and otherwise you're just you kind of it's a race to mediocrity isn't it so um, do we need to restructure an entire industry to make that happen or do people who feel frustrated by that just need to kind of t take a step out of it and, and decide to be a different kind of business um, that requires bravery and I think that's so does it need restructuring no does it need bravery absolutely did you get the answer you wanted <laughs> uh, are there any last questions uh, I see one here I noticed when you were speaking that quite a lot of your designs involve technology and increasingly more so. And I just wanted to ask you about the darker side of technology. So when you sign up to an app, for example, you give your email address and other personal contact details and quite often those end up getting sold to other companies and the outcome is further down the line you get loads of nuisance calls. And I was also thinking about you know, every time when you update your Apple iPhone, Apple takes a little bit more ownership of your data and your privacy gets more encroached upon. And how do you avoid that in the work you do, considering it's so expensive to start an app in the first place and maintain it? Yeah. Um, generally speaking, we, um, so none of our apps are on the App Store. So um, they're kind of, they're sort of web-based tools that people might use. Um, I mean, we like. I wouldn't even know how to go about selling people's data, to be honest. So, like in terms of our own products, um, but quite often what we're doing is recommending that somebody else's product is used instead. I think what's really important is to understand how users feel about privacy surrounding that particular issue. So, in some, with some tools, people are like, "Yeah, no, it's fine. Of course, they would want to hold my credit card, or of course, they would want my personal details, and I'm comfortable with that." Um, in other instances. Um, in fact, I was literally at some user research last night where a whole group of people were saying, absolutely not, there is absolutely no way I would give any information to, um, you know, a kind of random app um, because it's such kind of personal, sensitive data. So it's, a, it's about designing around those constraints. Um, and, I mean, I do think... It's a bit of a cop-out, but I do think some of that will begin to change over time as people just become unprepared to deal with the consequences of kind of data being sold and I also think that people are working on different types of business models that may one day scale but it's a bit of a cop-out really because the issue is kind of here and now um, but I, I do think users are what's important is users are prepared to have co mature conversations about that as well um, which is really interesting so attitudes can sometimes be a bit surprising like we assume everybody we either assume, yeah, everyone's cool with just sharing the data, or we assume everyone's a privacy freak, but the reality is much more nuanced than that, depending on the, th the thing you're using. I don't think I answered that very well, but... Right, unless there's any final questions, uh, I think I would draw this to a close. Um, just to say, I think it would be familiar um, territory to many of the design educators in the audience, and certainly reiterated tonight about sort of the the unprecedented challenges that we're facing in the world today um, highlighted in, in Kerry's talk, but um, as we all know, this offers a huge number of design opportunities as well, so we hope that people will never give up and, and go forth and sort of seize those opportunities to use their skills and network skills, empathy and guts, right? <laughs> um, so, um, just to say that to celebrate the launch of the Student Design Awards, uh, we have a reception, a drinks reception downstairs, so you're all warmly invited to join us in the Benjamin Franklin Room, uh, which leads me to just uh, thank our wonderful speaker, Carrie Bishop. Thank you.